Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on the seventh (coughs) Sunday of Easter. Final Sunday of Easter. But it is still Easter. Uh, Please know that we are celebrating Holy Communion today. And please know that no matter where you are in your life or faith journey, you are welcome to participate in Holy Communion. The gift of God's grace received in the sacraments is free for all people. Uh, A few other things of note, our spring congregational meeting is happening today at 1045, so pretty much almost right after worship, uh, in the Fellowship Hall, so beware, the Fellowship Hall will be a little different today because we'll be having a meeting, but you can still come and get coffee and donuts, but please participate, or at least pay attention to the meeting, Um, and at the meeting we'll be electing council members, we hope, and (laughs) we need council members, by the way. Uh, And we'll also be hearing from our congregational uh, listening team. So come and have some donuts and coffee and be a part of our congregational meeting. Uh, Today is the last choir Sunday of the program year. (laughs) But I just want to say a big thank you to the choir for a great year. Thank you to Lisa for accompanying and, of course, to their fearless leader, Ivor. Thank you (laughs) for your directing this year. Uh, A few other things on the calendar, and uh, please join me this Wednesday for our first happy hour of the season. Come enjoy good conversation on Wednesday from 4.30 to 7 p.m. at Under Pressure Brewing in Golden Valley. Uh, And then later on, in a few weeks down the road, our youth are putting on another garage sale this year. That's happening June 8th through 10th, but donations are welcome anytime, so drop them off anytime during the week or bring them in on a Sunday. They can go... uh, at this point, probably in the youth room is the best option. So bring your donations to the youth room. Uh, and then finally, consider sharing your musical gifts with us during the summer as the summer is rapidly approaching. Uh, consider providing special music on a Sunday morning. There's an announcement in your bulletin about that, uh, and Ivor is more than willing to talk to you about that if you have any questions about what you should do. So please consider that. All right, I think that's all I have as far as announcements go. So let us now turn to the call to worship printed in our bulletin. (coughs) We come together in this place to be people of worship. By your presence, your love, and take part in all that is done here. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. (coughs) 
Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We sing together our gathering hymn, number 521. Please stand as you are able. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you always.
God in the highest glory. We praise your name. Glory to God in the highest. Lord, we praise your name. Glory to God in the pray together our prayer of the day. O God of glory, your Son, Jesus Christ, suffered for us and ascended to your right hand. Unite us with Christ and each other in suffering and in joy, that all the world may be drawn into your bountiful presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
Our first readings will be from Acts 1, verses 6 through 14. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It was not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you to heaven, from, up from in, up from you into heaven, will come, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. They returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All of these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. Together were certain women, including Mary, mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Holy wisdom, holy words. Amen. Let God arise and let God's enemies be scattered. Let those who Let the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. Let them also be merry and joyful. Sing to God, sing praises to God's name. Exalt the one who rides the clouds. I am is that name. Rejoice before God. In your Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose 
second reading will be from 1st Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's suffering, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion in your adversary, the devil prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters and all of the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks be to God. We prepare to hear the gospel by singing the gospel verses noted in your bulletin. Please stand as you are able. Gospel according to John. Glory to you, o Lord. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence and the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Christ. Please be seated. <clears throat> We are still in the final discourse of Jesus from John's Gospel, week three, so hopefully you've been paying attention. You may recall, if you've been paying attention, that this section called the final discourse in John's Gospel is a four-chapter section that is entirely unique to John, that is mostly a series of instructions from Jesus to his disciples before his crucifixion. This is Jesus trying to fit in as many instructions as possible into the night of the Last Supper. And that's when this happens, in case you didn't realize. This is the night of the Last Supper. That's when this happens. 
The Last Supper happens, and then, instead of a nice, relaxing evening, Jesus gives a lecture. Great, right? Of course, Jesus himself was never going to have a nice, relaxing evening because he knew that he was going to be arrested the next day. But the disciples could have because they didn't believe Jesus was going to be arrested or crucified until it actually happened. But for Jesus, why not give a lecture? What else is he going to do on this last night of freedom before his arrest, before his death? It at least gives him something to do. And also, the disciples are dreadfully ignorant of everything that's about to happen. So, a little instruction can't hurt. Get out your pencils and notebooks, fellas. Get ready. All right. So Jesus gives his lecture. We heard two weeks ago and last week from the beginning of this lecture, the beginning of the final discourse, where Jesus tells the disciples that he is going to go and prepare a place for them. Remember, that's John 14, 1 through 6, a very well-known funeral gospel reading because it's the passage that includes Jesus talking about in his Father's house there are many dwelling places or in the old translation, many mansions. It's this image of heaven being this great place. And so it's often used in funerals, rightfully so, it fits. But then things go off the rails. As Thomas asks for directions, and Philip asks to see God, but then Jesus promises to send the Holy Spirit. He tries to bring it back. All right, I'll send you the Holy Spirit, guys. And that's what we heard last week. We heard about Jesus sending the advocate, the new advocate, the helper, the paraclete, the one who walks alongside And next week, the Holy Spirit will finally arrive as we celebrate Pentecost. But for now, the disciples wait. And they continue to listen to Jesus try to explain all of this. And they try to understand as hard as that is for them. So today in our Gospel reading, we skip ahead. That was just the background. So we skip ahead now to the end of this discourse, the end of this four-chapter section before Jesus gets arrested. And in this section, Jesus takes an interesting turn with this instruction. He shifts his focus from the disciples to God. Which is to say, Jesus turns this into a prayer. He starts praying. But he prays out loud right in front of his disciples. So it's pretty clear that he wants the disciples to overhear this prayer. And in fact, it is a prayer, but it also is a continuation of the teaching. It is intended just as much for the disciples to hear as it is for God to hear. And even more than that, these words are for the first readers or the first hearers or listeners of John's gospel. These words that Jesus prays are also, I think, for the early church, for them to understand. But for that to make sense, we have to understand, we have to realize that the gospels are each written not just as independent histories of Jesus. That's not exactly what they are. The gospel writers didn't sit down to write the definitive story of Jesus so they could then send it off to their publisher and it would be sold in bookstores around the world. That wasn't the point. The gospels are each unique and they're each written for in a unique context by a unique author for a unique community. And that last part is maybe the most important. They are each written for a unique community. And the author of each gospel has an agenda. He has something that he's dealing with in this community that he is writing for, each of them. Now, that might sound negative to say that he has an agenda, the authors have an agenda, but it's really not. I mean, we all have agendas, right? So the author of John's gospel, we'll call him John. The gospel doesn't actually tell us that his name is John, by the way. We just have put that name on it. So John is writing for a specific community, an early Christian community, of course. That's true for all the Gospels. But each of the Gospels is written for a different Christian community. So John is writing for a community, and how he frames his Gospel, how he presents the stories, even the exact words that Jesus speaks, those are all written to address what was happening in that community. So what can we assume about the community that John writes to based on what Jesus says here, what he prays for? Well, it's probably safe to say that this community is in some way divided. There's probably some sort of conflict happening in this community. 
Shocking, right? Church division, church conflict in the first century. It's been happening since the very beginning. And it's sad, right? I would guess that if I were to ask all of you if you have ever been a part of some sort of church conflict, either in your own experience or if you know somebody who has, most of us would say, oh, of course. Churches always have conflicts, right? But if it makes you feel any better, that was true in the first century as well. And Jesus here prays for unity, right? That's that, the very end of this prayer. Actually, the prayer continues following this passage, but Jesus focuses on unity. I pray that they will be one, that these disciples will be one, that this early Christian community will be one, just as you and I, God, are one. And this focus on unity would su suggest that the early John's early community did not have it. They did not have unity, and they needed it. They had conflict, and Jesus wants them to be united. And it's interesting that this is the focus of Jesus' prayer, right? It's unity. Think of all the things Jesus could have prayed for for the early church. Jesus could have prayed that the early church might prevail over the Roman Empire, but he doesn't do that. Jesus could have prayed that the early church would grow to become a megachurch with stadium seating in a coffee shop, but he doesn't pray for that. Jesus could have prayed that the church would worship in a traditional liturgical style or a contemporary style or whatever it might be, and he doesn't pray for that. Instead, Jesus simply prays for unity. And the reason why this is so important to Jesus and to John for his community is that I think it is impossible for the church to live out the mission Jesus calls it to live out if it is divided. Which means that John's community is in all likelihood not living out its mission. Even right away, this is the early church, it's just gotten started, and they're not doing the things that Jesus would have wanted them to do. The things that God is calling them to do, because they are divided. So Jesus prays that they get it together, that they get united. And John emphasizes that in his gospel for his people. There's a book, one of the very few books that I still have from seminary that I refer to regularly is a book by a German New Testament scholar named Udo Schneller. Great name, right? But he wrote a book that, that basically is like a little summary of each of the New Testament writings. And one of the things that he talks about is when it was written, or some of the things he talks about are when the books were written, by whom they were written, for whom they were written, which is important. Um, and it's... It's really fascinating, but I looked, I looked up John's gospel because I was curious, and he says that, yes, in fact, John's community was dealing with conflict, three of them, in fact. There was a conflict between the disciples of Jesus and the disciples of John the Baptist that were still happening in the early church. John the Baptist still had followers that thought maybe he was the Messiah. So in John's community, there were disciples of John the Baptist, and they were, they were fighting. Um... There was a conflict between those Christians who were Jewish originally and those Christians who were Gentiles. So Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians were fighting. And then there was a, a theological conflict between those who thought Jesus was truly human and those who thought he only appeared to be human but was really just God putting on some sort of illusion, pretending to be human. Something like that, like God in a human suit. That's another way of describing it. The official heresy is docetism, if you want to look it up. But that was one of the conflicts happening. So there are all these conflicts happening in John's community, and it doesn't even really matter what they were about. They were happening, and that's what's important. And we can understand it, I think. We can understand why these conflicts happen, in the church or not, and just in our society, in our community. We're living in a time that is, we're told over and over, and over again, is one of the most divided times in history, at least in American history. We hear over and over on the news about how divided we are as a country, which honestly isn't helpful to be told over and over again about that. So how do we come together? How do we avoid the kind of division that John's community was dealing with and that so many churches have dealt with over the centuries? I don't know that there's a magic solution, but I think that if we go back to what Jesus says at the Last Supper, which has happened that same day, recall, we might get a hint at what might help us. Jesus says at the Last Supper to his disciples, and they have a hard time with this, and so do we, but he says to them, just love each other. 
That's it. Just love. Love one another. As Jesus loves us, love one another. And I know that's easier said than done, but somehow that has to be the core of who we are as the church, as followers of Jesus. The second we start looking at someone and judging them, we have to shift to love. The second we start thinking someone doesn't belong, we have to shift to love. We are concluding this season of Easter today and this week, and Easter ultimately means that love always wins. That's the message. That's what Easter is about. The powers of violence and destruction and division thought they had defeated defeated Jesus. They thought it was over. They thought they had done their work, but Jesus proved them wrong by showing them that their violence and their death did not have the last word. The voices and powers of this world that seek to divide us and exclude some, they will not win. If we respond with love as Jesus calls us to do, they will not win. Because responding with love means changing the story. It means uniting instead of dividing. It means viewing each other with compassion instead of suspicion. And it means loving each other even when the world tells us not to. And the world tells us who we're supposed to hate, who we're supposed to dislike, who we're supposed to separate ourselves from. Only the love of God lived out through God's people, through us, can truly counteract the works of violence and division and hate that so often bubble up in our culture, in our society, in our world. And we are the ones Jesus has called to live out God's love in just such a way. Amen.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of harmony, as you draw your son to your side, you draw us to you and unite us with the planet and one another. Weave your church together in a web of mutual love for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As your spirit hovered over the waters of creation, so your spirit hovers over all that you have made. Bless the water that sustains the planet and grant wisdom to use it wisely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You empower your people with the fire of your spirit. Challenge activists and organizers, teachers and politicians, and all in leadership to speak a message of peace and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You care for all your children. Show your steadfast love to those suffering isolation, especially exiles, refugees, or prisoners. Break the chains of all held fast by systemic oppression of any kind. Comfort all who are afraid or suffering from illness. We pray especially for Jenny Malley, Liz Rokola, Deb Michelson, Jackie Peterson, and those we name before you in our hearts. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks that humankind serves as your body in the world, stewarding your abundant gifts. Guide this congregation's leaders as they seek your will. We pray especially for our staff and council. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You raise your saints to new life in Christ. We give you thanks for all your saints who have given us glimpses of your redeeming love. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We share that peace with one another. We continue with the offering.
We sing together our offertory response. Please stand as you are able. When Jesus sat at a table with all kinds of people, he proclaimed that God's care knows no bounds. We claim again the hope of that witness, and we invite all to share in the promise of forgiveness that is received at God's table. We are people who share a history and a story. It is ancient and contains these words. On the night of Passover, Jesus took the bread, offered a prayer to God, broke the bread and gave it to his followers, saying, This is my body given for you. When you eat it, remember me. Then Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and all people. Drink it, all of you, and remember me. As we take this bread and cup, we celebrate the truth of Christ's forgiveness, and we pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready. Please be seated. A few words of instruction. For those of you worshiping with us from home, you are invited to share communion with one another. If you are worshiping from home by yourself, I invite you to take communion now. The body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. For those of us here in person, you'll come forward at the direction of the ushers. The center aisle, take an empty cup. Come forward and receive the bread in the center and the wine off to either side. Uh, if you need grape juice, take that instead of the empty cup. And if you need gluten-free, take that in the center as well. All are welcome. <laughs>
May this bread and cup shared in the name of Jesus, our Savior, strengthen us in this life and secure us in the hope of life beyond death. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for Jesus, your word in human flesh. We thank you for showing yourself to us in Jesus' life in this world. If we go to the heights of the mountains or the depths of the sea, we can be sure that we are precious to you. By this meal, we are strengthened to be your servants in the world. Grant us your grace, peace, hope, and joy. Amen.
Christian hymn, please stand as you are able. Go in peace, serve the risen one.